Father, thank you today that as we just pause for a minute and just let those lyrics sink in. God, how I pray that that is true. That is true for every one of us that we do believe in God the Father. We do believe in Christ the Son. We do believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God, three in one. And Father, today we're here just to do nothing else but lift up your name and worship you. I thank you for giving us an opportunity to come into your presence, set aside the thoughts and the cares of our world, and just hang out and fellowship with you and bask in your presence. God, I pray that as we continue to worship through the truth of your word, that your Holy Spirit will work in our heart and that you'll take the written word and may it bear witness to the living word, Jesus Christ. And I pray that you will be on the throne of our life as we worship you today and especially as we go out to worship you in a little while. God, I thank you for your word. Continue to speak to us. Continue to teach us. Continue to draw us close to you as we celebrate you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I do invite you to to take your Bible this morning and open with me to the little book of 2 Peter. Uh, We're in the beginning of the second chapter today as we move through our study of 2 Peter together. I don't know about you, but uh, most people look for bargains in life. I know that um, in our family, we, we generally are looking for not having to pay the full price for something. We all want a great bargain. According to the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, often bargains disappoint customers and may even cause harm to people and even fuel organized crime. And by bargains here, I'm talking about counterfeit products, knockoffs to the original. Because knockoffs are destructive. Uh, A list of counterfeit products may include clothes or footwear or jewelry or handbags or electronics or toys and these kinds of things where where people are trying to put on an impression that is really a false impression. Again, according to U.S. Customs and Border Protection agents, the dangers, and I quote, the dangers of buying counterfeit products aren't always obvious. The best way to fight back is to educate yourself about the most commonly counterfeited products. In other words, if it looks too good to believe, it probably is too good to believe. Are you aware that there are false gospels out there that are dangerous as well? We're going to be introduced to some of those ideas this morning about false gospels. See, God created you to spend life honoring Him and worshiping Him and in fellowship with Him, praising Him. He draws you to Himself. We we saw last week, He draws you to Himself with authority and with clarity and with certainty. So there is a defense against a false gospel. You can hear God draw you to Himself as you do three things. And we looked at these things specifically last week. When you consume His Word, when you conform to His Word, And when you cling to His Word. And so today we're looking at an application of those three points. See, God's Word is truth. Every bit of God's Word is truth. And you and I can trust God's truth. There are many things in this world we can't trust. But we can trust God's truth. In these last days... There are those who falsify the truth, and it's very, very costly. Cheap counterfeit truth will disappoint. Cheap counterfeit truth will cause harm to people. And cheap counterfeit truth will fill the pockets of the manufacturers and the distributors of false truth. 
So you have a defense against false prophets and false teachers. In these last days, Simon Peter encourages us to trust God's truth. Last week, we ended chapter 1 of uh, 2 Peter with verse 25. It says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And that's where we pick up this morning. Remember that as we move into chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. You follow along with me as I read it aloud. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. I pray today that God will empower His Word and enlighten our lives with His Word. This is God's Word. So we have three warnings in this specific passage about false teachers and false prophets. So let's look at them. First of all, false teachers distort God's truth. False teachers distort God's God's truth. Uh, so first, let's just, let's just break down this verse as we move through it in the next few minutes. Verse 1 says, But false prophets also arose among the people. So a prophet was someone who heard and proclaimed the message from God. So contrary to that, a false prophet is someone who makes up a message and claims that that message is from God. Big difference between the two. A false teacher, on the other hand, is someone who takes what is consistent with the gospel truth, which a true teacher, a true gospel teacher will teach. A true gospel teacher teaches something that is consistent. Every word, every iota, every dot consistent with God's truth. So a false teacher would be someone who only teaches what is beneficial to them. They tweak God's truth so it is a benefit to themselves. That's a false teacher. They secretly bring in destructive heresies. This idea of secretly bringing in, it's like somebody who's smuggling something in. They're pulling the wool over somebody's eyes by smuggling in a destructive heresy. So what is a destructive heresy? Well, any deviation from the truth, whether you're taken away from the truth or whether you're adding to the truth, any deviation from the truth is no longer truth. So false teachers distort the truth. They smuggle in false teaching and they know what they're doing. I had a friend who's no longer alive who came to trust Jesus Christ later in life. In his earlier life, he spent several years smuggling drugs from South Florida up the 95 corridor to the Northeast. He knew what he was doing. He said, he told me, he said, you know, the first time I did it, I was only going to do it one time. But after doing it one time, I was hooked. See, he was hooked on his own drug habit and to support his own drug habit, at his own, own drug habit, he was smuggling the drugs from Florida to the Northeast. And it continued as a way of life until one day Jesus intercepted his life and transformed his life. Again, he knew what he was doing. False teachers intentionally smuggle in their false teaching. So what do they smuggle? Well, they secretly bring in destructive heresies, Peter says. See, again, any deviation from the truth is no longer the truth. It's a deceptive 
heresy. A destructive, deceptive heresy begins with Satan creating doubt about the truth. Remember in Genesis chapter 3, Satan looked at Adam and said, Did God really say not to eat this fruit? Did God really say that Jesus is the only way to restore your relationship with God? Did God really say that Sunday is the Lord's day to be set aside to worship and to honor God exclusively? Did God really say that every sin is just as serious as every other sin? See, Satan just, he sifts into our mind a question. And that's where deceptive heresy begins. Did God really say? Timothy Keller tweeted this week an interesting quote. He said, the Roman Empire said, you Christians are too exclusive. You threaten the social order because you won't honor all deities. 2,000 years later, the modern West says, you Christians are too exclusive. You threaten the social order because you won't honor all deities. <laughs> See, in the, in the Roman Empire, it was a little bit different. People worshipped gods that were made with hands. People worshipped created kinds of things. They even worship the, the powerful deities. In other words, uh, Simon Peter was just weeks or maybe even months away from being executed by the Roman government when he wrote this. The Roman government held up the Caesar, their emperor, as God. And that was kind of a common practice during those days. But today, the charge of being too narrow-minded may look a little bit different from that. But it's just as much of a threat. People today worship things like identity and influence and material things. Work, status, appearance, sports, entertainment, sex, comfort, technology, even family can be a false god. See, anything we put over the priority of God in our life becomes a false god. And when we worship anything other than God Himself as the priority of our life, we fall into a deceptive teaching, a deceptive heresy. See, you were made, I was made, to worship God exclusively. And that means putting Him in the highest place in my life. You putting Him in the highest place in your life. So let me ask you today to consider a few things. Where do you spend most of your time thinking? In other words, what occupies the thought process of your life? How much time do you spend worshiping God? as the priority of your life. Again, the gospel calls us to put Him first. So how do you spend your time? How do you spend your money? How do you invest your life in God's kingdom? Where do you get your joy? What is always on your mind? See, those things are reflections of whether or not we have God and His truth as the priority of our life. The Bible says Jesus is the only way to God. Jesus is the true way to God. Jesus is the living way to God. Do you know Him? Are you honoring Him in the highest place in your heart and in your life? Because any deviation from that is a false gospel. It's false truth, and it's serious. It blocks our relationship with God. False prophets smuggle in destructive heresies. That means that they're damaging to us. See, Jesus warned against false teachers, didn't he? Let me just give you a few examples. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 and 16, 
Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing and inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 11, And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. In Mark chapter 13, verses 22 and 23, Jesus said, For false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. And today, we even have a greater advantage over those that Jesus was talking to in His day because we have His living written Word to hold up every day to be our guide to truth to that which is against the the truth. Not only did Jesus warn about false prophets, but Paul also warned against false prophets in Acts chapter 20, verses 29 and 30. He said, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will rise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert. Church, this is something that's incredibly important. Destructive, false gospels destroy God's people and God's truth. In 2 Corinthians, Paul said, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 and 15, Paul says that false teachers disguise themselves. It shouldn't surprise you that false teachers come looking like ordinary, regular teachers, true teachers. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, Paul says, False teachers distort the gospel of Christ, here's the key, in order to please man. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, Paul says that false teachers' consciences are seared. In other words, They've done it so much that they don't even realize it when they're doing it. And then John, the beloved apostle of Jesus, also warned against false teachers. For example, in 2 John, that whole little book, it's only one chapter. Half of it is giving praise and glory to those who are true followers of the true gospel. Half of it is about a warning to false teachers. For example, in verses 7 and 8 of 2 John, For many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. The Bible consistently warns us against following false teachers. Against propagating a false gospel. False teachers distort the truth. They tell people what people want to hear rather than what God actually says. They speak to make people feel good rather than feel godly. And again, if you take away any part of the gospel, adding to it or taking away from it, you are living and teaching according to a false gospel. may be denying the deity of Christ. It may be denying the triunity of God, the three in one that we sang about earlier. It may be denying the substitutionary atonement for Christ that His blood actually does pay the penalty for the price of your sins. It may be casting a shadow on the miracles of the Bible. Oh, they really didn't happen. They're just examples, some would say. They're not literal. That's a false gospel. False teachers distort the truth when they add to or take away from God's Word. And that's why it's imperative. Let me remind us again. It's imperative to consume God's Word and to conform our lives to God's Word and to cling to God's Word. It's a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. We hide its words in our heart that we might not sin against God, that we might not fall to false teachers and a false gospel. In a few weeks, our small group discussion guide is going to take us to John 8 before we 
take a little summer break. Jesus said in John 8, 31 and 32, If, you hear that now? If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Only the truth will set you free from the false doctrines, the false gospels that are out here in our world. And that takes us to the end of verse 1 of 2 Peter chapter 2. Here's the way it ends. Even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. I don't know how to overstate this. Believers are bought with a price. The price for the freedom for your sin and my sin came at the sacrifice of the life of the Son of God. What is a sacrifice? A sacrifice is somebody giving up their life for the benefit of someone else. And that's what Jesus Christ has done for us. Now, it's curious to me that Simon Peter would use this language here. Look at the verse again. He says, even denying the Master. Back on Good Friday this year, I mean on uh, Palm Sunday this year, we studied John chapter 19. In John chapter 19, what did Simon Peter, this very man who wrote this, what did he do three times when Jesus was on trial? He denied Jesus. To a little slave girl, he cowered down and said, I don't even know him. I don't know that man. Can you imagine what Simon Peter went through the next two or three days after that? Can you imagine that how, how he felt after denying the Savior he had walked with for three years. He had seen do the miracles. He had heard teaching. Can you imagine what he felt like? I don't know about you, but I've been there before. I've denied Jesus. I've failed him. But thank God for Peter, that wasn't the end of the story. Thank God for you and me, that doesn't have to be the end of the story. So how can, how can you deny the master who bought you? Jesus sacrificed his life for your life and my life. And when you and I choose any other master than Jesus, when we choose to put anybody or anything else in priority over him, in reality, we are denying the master who bought us, who sacrificed his life for us. Choosing not to believe in Jesus is the ultimate price you'll ever pay. Because if you choose not to believe in Jesus, then you're separated from God for eternity. But Peter is teaching us here that unbelievers are not the only ones who deny the master who bought us. Believers can also choose to deny Jesus. And what we're going to find out is when we choose to deny Jesus, it's not only destructive to our life, but it's destructive to everybody in our circle of influence as well. So again, it's a very serious matter. To deny the master who bought you. I encourage you today. First of all, if you've never believed in Jesus, trust him today. Believe in him today. Choose to admit that you need him. That your sin separates you from God. You understand that. And you confess that. You confess your sin before God and repent and turn away from your sin. And say, God... Never again do I want to deny you. I want to spend the rest of my life standing up for you and being counted for you. Denying Jesus brings destruction to the unbeliever. It also brings destruction to the believer until we repent and turn away from our sin. So the gospel calls you to come to God on his terms. Come to God with a confessional, repentant heart. 
be willing to turn away from believing false gospels that said life is about me, that life is about my comfort and my pleasure and all that I can build up on this earth. Turn away from that and turn to Jesus and say, okay, Jesus, all to you I confess, all to you I give. I want my life to be totally, exclusively serving you and honoring you. It's a great day today to repent and turn away from our sin and turn to God. Verse 2 takes us to another thought about the false gospel. Why would anyone want to teach a false gospel? Well, secondly, false teachers are motivated by greed. False teachers are motivated by greed. We see that in verses 2 and 3. Verse 2 says, And many will follow their sensuality. The New Living Testament interprets that. Many will follow their depraved ways. And because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. You know what sensuality is. You know what depraved ways are. It's anything that feeds the flesh, that satisfies my personal fleshly need. It's sinful desires of the flesh without boundaries, without restraint. Whatever feels good, do it. Sensuality feel, feeds off of selfish feelings. I draw a circle around myself and all the world is about me. When I'm following sensual desires. When I'm following depraved ways. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. Jesus said, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these other things will be added to you as well. So the key is that my flesh has to be killed. It has to be destroyed. It has to be crucified when Christ was crucified. I crucify my my flesh so that I can be raised again to honor and glorify Jesus. Unethical, immoral behaviors are self-serving. And they contradict the godliness that Peter talked about in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. If you want to see what it looks like to walk in godliness, just look back a page in this little letter that, that Simon Peter wrote. It's serious business. And when a teacher's actions are not consistent with his words, when a believer's actions are not consistent with our words, it's destructive to the gospel not just harmful to you and me, it's harmful to those around us. I cannot even begin to tell you how grieved that I've recently been over high-profile leaders in my life that I look up to have been exposed for abuse and sexual sins and then intentional cover-ups to those abuses and those sexual sins. Their behavior reflects their real heart. I, I just have to tell you, when every Sunday that I preach, I'm so humbled before coming and standing in this place Because God forbid that I would ever share anything that would be inconsistent with the truth of His Word and the truth of what I've lived out in the week before. I mean, every week seems to be a kind of revival for me because I know how much I respect God's Word and how much I respect His truth and how clearly I want His truth to not only be exposed through what I say with my words, but what I live with my life. It's a humbling experience. And that should be no less true for every believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to be speaking with our mouth the word of the Lord. But our actions must always back up the words that we speak. And unfortunately, in many people that the world might consider to be idols in our generation. 
have literally failed at this point recently. Some of these leaders, listen to this now, are not faults in what they teach, but when their lives do not match what they teach, it discredits their message. It doesn't discredit the gospel message, but it discredits their message to the world. And the world, I'll guarantee you, is looking at what they want to see. And when they can't see the truth through the cloudiness of someone's life, the gospel is distorted. The truth is distorted. So how do you know if you've fallen into the trap of living a false gospel or listening to a false gospel? Well, Simon Peter put it well in chapter 1. He said, check the fruit of the life of the teacher. And then check the fruit of your own life. <laughs> Is your life consistently consumed with spending time with God and worshiping Him and glorifying Him? Is He the priority of your life? And does the fruit of your life represent that kind of relationship that you have with God? That is the bottom line. That is the truth. Are you justifying any sensual or depraved behavior patterns in your life? Let me give you a few specific examples here. Because in our generation today, it's epidemic. Pornography, for example, exposes the heart of one who has been led astray by a false doctrine that says, if it feels good, do it. If it feels good, look at it. That's a lie. That's a false doctrine. Drinking too much exposes the pattern of living a self-gratifying life. Is that being exposed? Any distortion of godliness in your life at the expense of the gospel is in fact following a false truth, following a false teacher, following a false doctrine. Peter is clearly calling believers to know the truth and living the truth. Look back at chapter 1 if you want to see how to do that. In verse 3 then he says, In their greed, and this is the point here, In their greed they will exploit you with false words. See, false teachers are motivated by greed. Greed is a strong, selfish desire to have more. Someone once asked one of the wealthiest men in the world, how much is enough? You know what he said, just a little bit more, just a little bit more, just a little bit more. There's never, never, never enough. That's a spirit of greed. And the object of greed can be money, it can be power, usually it's both, money and power. Greed is a trap. It brings ruin. It brings destruction. The Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money and power is sin because it gets in the way of you putting God in the highest place in your life and you worshiping God. It gets in the way of putting God first. Greed can be so subtle. Simon Peter, the author of this text, heard Jesus expound on this idea in Matthew chapter 18 beginning with verse 16 here's what Jesus said behold a man came to Jesus saying teacher what good deed must I do to have eternal life Jesus said to him why do you ask me about what is good there's only one who is good if you would enter life keep the commandments he said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I've kept, what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go and sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. Greed. 
Greed cost this young man walking with Jesus and spending eternity with God in heaven. Greed refuses to be satisfied. The more we get, the more we want. Your attitude about giving according to God's plan is an example of what controls your heart, what controls your life. And again, the problem is not money. The problem is not power. The problem is your heart, your attitude about it. God deserves to be our greatest desire. So is your heart putting God first above everything else? It's one thing to say you love God with all your heart. What do your actions show? Are you greedy? In your greed, they will exploit you. You know what it means to be exploited. It means that you've been intentionally taken advantage of. And that's what false teachers do. They're never satisfied. Greed drives them to destroy their own lives and then destroy the lives of those who follow them. Dishonoring God's truth. A false teacher may ask you something like this. Why don't you give your money to my ministry rather than giving to the church through the local church? Better beware if you ever hear anybody say something like that. Because God's plan is always perfect. And trusting God's plan is the only way for you to live joyfully. And the only way to satisfy what it means to truly honor Him with what you have and who you are. It's dangerous to follow false teachers as I wrap this up this morning. Number three, false teachers are doomed. And we're going to pick up here next week, so we're not going to exhaust this thought. But let me, let me expound on it just for a moment. In verse three, the end of verse 3, he says, Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Believers, expect false doctrine to come at you. Expect false teachers to be out here in our world. We've been warned about it for more than 2,000 years. Those who teach anything contradictory to the message and life of Jesus, and those who follow such teaching, will be punished. The Bible says... The harm they cause will lead them to doom, to despair, to destruction. God is a righteous judge. That means He never overlooks even the slightest sin. And He will judge unbelievers like child molesters and child murderers, other sex offenders. And even those who participate in what we consider to be minor kinds of sins. God is a righteous judge. And He never overlooks any sin. He's going to judge unbelievers and He's going to judge believers who spread and even live according to false teaching. Now I know this is is a harsh message for us today. But it's the truth. And we need to not miss it. So be careful who you listen to. Be careful who you follow. Following a false gospel is avoidable. By consuming gospel truth and conforming to gospel truth and clinging to gospel truth. Condemnation is a serious word. When a guilty verdict is pronounced on someone, a death sentence is imposed. It's serious. And we need to take this seriously. Peter warns us not to overlook the fact that there are false teachers out there that will lead you to a verdict that leads to doom and condemnation. And the reality is all of us are guilty. All of us are doomed. All of us stand before God, and if we stand in our own strength, we're doomed. But thankfully, God has sent us a Savior 
who sacrificed his life to stand in our place, to stand between us and God. And when you trust Jesus, when you give your life to Jesus, God looks at you and who does he see? He sees Jesus. And my prayer today is that you will trust him. You have every reason to surrender your life and believe in Jesus today. Accepting his payment for your sin is the only way that you will not stand condemned before God in your own flesh, in your own strength. There's a better way. And the better way is by trusting Jesus. That is the truth. And you can trust God's truth. So in conclusion, I want to challenge you not to settle for a knockoff, not to settle for a gospel that's a false gospel, not to follow a false teacher. Trust God's truth. You do that by knowing the truth, living consistently with the truth, and never compromising the truth. A friend of mine, Neil McGlowan, said this, Never compromise truth for warm bodies, hot talent, or cold cash. Just don't do it. It's not worth it. We're living in the last days. We were all saddened on Tuesday when we heard the report of the massacre in Uvalde, Texas. My response to that, uh, I want to challenge you, church, that every time you hear something about that incident or the dozens of other incidents like that that have happened in 2022, One response, pray. Pray for the victims. Pray for the families. Pray for those who would do such an insidious kind of thing. That's our best response, is to pray and ask God for guidance and direction and comfort and strength and mercy. Pray. Don't talk about it more than you pray about it. Also, we come to a time this week, tomorrow, we celebrate Memorial Day in our country. Memorial Day is a day where we remember those who have served in the armed forces and they're no longer alive. That's what a memorial is. It's remembering Someone who has gone in the past and done something that truly benefits you. We have so much to be grateful for in this country. And I pray that you will celebrate Memorial Day this year in a prayerful spirit. That's the truth of what God calls us to do. But also there's another memorial that is even more significant that we just want to take a minute and celebrate this morning. In your seat or near your seat, there should be a communion pack. And I want to invite you to take that out right now. Because as believers, this is, this is a very special celebration, very special time. And here's why. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper on that last Passover that he spent before the day he was crucified... He asked us to remember the fact that he came to this earth and lived as as one of us. The bread represents the body of Christ. The fact that he came to this earth and he lived a perfect life as God in the flesh. He showed us what it looks like to be God and to know God and to follow God. And then on that Friday, he hung there on the cross And the cup that you hold in your hand represents the blood that Jesus shed. And we remember that Jesus made that ultimate sacrifice and shed his blood to pay the penalty for our sin. So we can confess our sin and we can be forgiven of our sin. And this this cup represents the blood that takes away the sin of the world. 
So the bread represents the body of Christ. The cup represents the blood of Christ. And then thirdly, we remember that Jesus promised to return to this earth again. Do you believe that? He's coming back again. And every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, Jesus said, remember me until I come again. And so today, on this day before Memorial Day in our country, we remember the highest memorial. And that is that God came to earth as flesh and lived among us. He sacrificed his life to die for us so that we could be set free from our sin. And as we eat and as we drink, we remember that he's coming back again. So eat and drink and remember. Father, I thank you today that we can celebrate your truth. That your truth is clear. It's unquestionable. And it's the only thing that will bring us back into fellowship with you when we have sinned against you. God, I pray today that as your Holy Spirit moves in this place, that there would be a convergence of the gospel truth that your word is, that has been shared here today. The gospel truth that celebrates the triunity of God in flesh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And now, God, we continue with our life to want to give testimony to who you are in our life, that you've transformed our life. I pray that if there's one here who's never surrendered their life to you, that today would be the day when they say, God, I admit I'm a sinner. I confess my sin before you. I believe in you. I repent of my sin. I turn away from my sin. And I want to spend the rest of my life giving praise to you. So, so today, I surrender all to you. In Jesus' name now, we continue to worship. Amen.